parasites have lived both on and in us since the beginning of man. They have evolved to develop specialized techniques to invade our bodies and evade our defenses. While medical advances have bolstered our ability to detect and treat parasitic infections, the parasites continue their quest for shelter and sustenance within us. One method of infection is through our dietary intake. Imported foods have played a significant part in the increase of parasitic infections in the U.S. Today, after the agricultural revolution and the course of rapid transit, the ability to ship products from one place to the other in less than 18 hours. Parasites can come to us now. We don't have to go to them any longer. So this raises the possibility for the spread of parasites in places that they never existed before. Another interesting aspect of the whole phenomenon of seed germ diseases is uh, a parasitic disease called Anastaphis. It's caused by a fish parasite that is transmitted to humans when they eat sushi, which of course is uncooked fish. And this parasite, which is a normal parasite of fish, can be acquired by humans and it causes a, a local invasion of the gastrointestinal tract that in some cases can mimic stomach disease or appendicitis. In this country, in the United States, we've had a burgeoning sushi industry. Lots of people eat sushi. In fact, I eat sushi. And I eat it safely. Why? Because we now know how this parasite is transmitted. Uh, it, it requires the fish to sit around for a while in a non-fresh state. Now, you can define that any way you want, but in fact, if you catch a fish and place it on ice immediately, the parasite stays in the gut tract of those fish. If, on the other hand, you catch the fish and it sits on the deck of the boat for a while and warms up, the parasites will then crawl out of the gut tissue into the meat of the fish. Now, when you put it on ice, bring it in and make sushi out of that, you have the option, at least, of, of catching that worm. We've become aware of that fish that is served in the sushi parlors of America, at least, and I'm sure in Japan as well, is as fresh as the day it was caught. But not all food-borne parasitic infections have been conquered. Because of their insatiable appetite for suitable hosts, parasites will always search out new ways of infecting us. Tapeworms are parasitic flatworms that live in the intestine of humans. Most commonly, they're acquired through the ingestion of uncooked flesh that has the larval stages of the parasite. And there appears to be a tapeworm that corresponds to each type of major meat that's ingested. For instance, there's a beef tapeworm, Tinea saginata, there's a fish tapeworm, known as Diphthalobacium latum, there's a pork tapeworm named Tinea solium. Tineosolium, the pork tapeworm, has emerged as an important infection not only in many developing countries, but also in the United States as well. The parasite is particularly prevalent in Central America and in Mexico, and now the organism has been imported over the border to the point where it has become a major infection in U.S. cities that are near these countries. So we find high rates of Tineosolium infection in Los Angeles, in San Diego, in San Antonio, in Tucson, Arizona. The reason this is of importance to note is because the larval stages of the pork tapeworm have been linked to an illness in the brain. There is a syndrome associated with tenosolium known as neurocystic psychosis that has now become one of the leading causes of epilepsy among children living in these cities in the southwestern United States. The pork tapeworm, the egg, when it's ingested into the human, the larva that emerges from that egg and thinks it's in a pig, the larva will go and insist in various parts of the human anatomy, unfortunately including, and apparently the parasite seems to have a tropism for human neural tissue. So you can get cysts in the brain, you can get cysts in the eye, you can get cysts in the musculature as well. This disease is called cystocercosis. 
Imported and undercooked food is not the only way we can ingest a parasite. Fresh, clean water can never be taken for granted. And the water we drink in our homes can be tainted. One of the most common parasites in the United States, besides Cryptosporidium, uh, is Giardia lambda. Giardia lambda is, is, is one of our more uh, photogenic parasites. Uh, parasitologists love to talk about Giardia because it looks like a little monkey face, or it has a personality, it has a smile, it has a little flagella. People like to talk about it. They don't like to catch it. So where do you catch Giardia? Well, you catch it from drinking contaminated water. By the breakdown of public health practices, which ensures the safety of our drinking water, it's a constant struggle to maintain a uh, filtered water supply for communities that are dependent upon those filtered water supplies. In reservoirs, for instance, or in natural bodies of water, they have a real problem ensuring the fact that uh, Giardia lambda doesn't enter their drinking water supply. And any time the filtration system fails, you can get outbreaks of Giardia. It's well known that Giardia can stand survive chlorination, especially if the chlorination is not being done to adequate levels. So there have been uh, large waterborne outbreaks of giardiasis in the United States associated with either malfunctioning or poorly designed municipal water supplies. The diarrheal disease caused by giardia is somewhat different than the usual diarrheal illness because of where the parasite lives in the human host and the fact that, in, especially in heavy infections, the parasite actually adheres to the walls of the small intestine, uh, but generally speaking, can be treated with antibiotics. While giardiasis may cause us temporary discomfort, waterborne disease in the tropics can bring crushing illness. The guinea worm known formally as Metamensis, 